I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, everything you ever wanted to know about the pharmaceutical industry but did not know where to turn. Well, there is a book that is, believe it or not, a page turner on this industry. It is called The Global Pharmaceutical Industry, Economic Structure, Government Regulation, and History. It is written by Dr. Hank Lasky, and we are delighted to have him here today as a guest on Spotlight. Hank, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Logan. It's an honor. I loved your book. It's so readable and it's so broad in its scope. It's encyclopedic in its knowledge. Um, tell me a little bit about why you wrote the book. Um, well, I first got involved with the pharmaceutical industry with my senior research project as an undergraduate at Clemson University. Um, my, Gosh, I have to back up a little bit and tell you this, that General Littlejohn at Clemson was the in charge of all the logistics and, and supply during, in the European theater. And he brought back Berichta, um, which is an encyclopedia kind of, um, of the unified or uh, German chemical societies. Um, and I got into that thing. It took me a month or so, but I found the uh, recipe, so to speak, for intermediol, which is a pharmaceutical precursor compound. And I developed it from corn derived furfural. Uh, and so that's how I got started. Um, later, uh, after my PhD at the University of Georgia, um, I taught at a bunch of schools around the world, mm. uh, many schools, and found, and found that there was a tremendous need for this. So when I finally got to Fairleigh Dickinson, um, I got a lot of MDs in my classes and they didn't know much about business. And I also got some business students in my class and they didn't know much about the industry. Um, but all the entire group, every semester in every class, they, they wanted to know more about the industry and there was no good book. That exactly. could and you were heading up the MBA program at that point at Fairleigh Dickinson, correct? I'm sorry, what? You're heading up the MBA program at Fairleigh Dickinson? Director of the MBA program and assistant dean at Fairleigh Dickinson, yeah, in the TNET campus. <laughs> it's amazing how little medical doctors know about the business of medicine or their ancillary uh, industries such as pharmacy. Yeah, yeah. The industry has gone through tremendous change with um, pharmacy benefit managers, um, the doctors, the, the whole business aspect has been taken away from the individual practice, the private practice, and put in the hands of, of a large number of, um, for lack of a better word, secretarial personnel. But they're highly trained, and um, they're the ones who manage things. And when they finally bring that doctor into that little room, then the doctor does the doctor thing. But everything else prior to that and after that is controlled by a corporation of some sort. Absolutely. And it's also controlled, as you write in the book, by nerds and labs. You say there are nerds and labs all over the world and that you're one of them, right? I was one of them. I probably still am one of them. Um, yeah, these are these are wonderful people. I've worked a lot with them. Um, I call them nerds because they really are not in the in the um, funny sense that we use that word, but they're scientists. They are deeply involved in scientific theory and hypotheses and testing molecules at a high level of sophistication. Very highly trained people with an exceptional core competence. Um, and, and the industry is built on them. You know, it's like the doctors and the, and the corporations that control the business. You've got the nerds or the scientists, and then the corporation controls what happens there and afterward. It's amazing how much negative press the pharmaceutical industry takes and gets, uh, considering all the contributions they make to humanity. You know, most people who reach our ages are on one, two, three, four, maybe more drugs that are keeping us active and healthy and fit. Yeah. And, uh, people seem to real, not realize the importance of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pity. 
Um, what, what I think about when, when I listen to you ask that question is that the university system in Germany and Austria were way ahead of anybody else in the world um, from about the 1300s on. And the first chemistry department in the world was in Germany uh, at the University of Marburg. Um, and, you know, many generations of PhDs, of business people with their parents and grandparents and great grandparents, et cetera, you know, going to high level universities, et cetera, they controlled the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. Mm absolutely controlled it. Um, now, you have to understand that there is a, a very serious linkage between the um, ingredients or the feedstock materials that go into dr modern synthetic drugs. Um, and there is a very close linkage between those feedstock materials and the feedstock materials for dye stuffs or the things that tint our clothes and give us, you know, cars with different colors. And mm. so at the time of World War I, England, for example, was producing 40,000 tons of, of dye stuffs and Germany was producing 400,000, 10 times as much. Mm. So they absolutely controlled the industry at the time of the war. Um, afterward, now, um, this industry worldwide has been built, for lack of a better word, by the baby boom generation that came after World War II. The only significant thing in my mind that happened during World War II pharmaceutical-wise was the development of penicillin. And that had a tremendous effect on our troops who were operating in different uh, situations in jungles, et cetera, deserts. Um, so, you know, I think about that kind of stuff uh, all the time. And how was it that they concentrated these very highly trained people, multi-generational training, into the Ruhr Valley? Um, Leverkusen, Ludwigshafen, the Pfizer brothers came from that, our cousins came from that area. And if you go there now, there are huge chemical facilities, uh, many of which were moved to Berlin during the war. Um, and the Germans just controlled everything. Uh, so I kind of forget your question. <laughs> no, we're just talking about the fact that the, the pharmaceutical industry is often disparaged, yet they make so many great contributions. Right, right. Well, it's got a tremendous, a long history and the history has been fought between nations. When, when the Allies won the war, all um, Axis patents were confiscated hmm. and made public property in the, the Allied countries. So here in this country, you had you know, all kinds of scientists pouring over that work and trying to understand it. And it required a generation, really, of newcomers to the industry to decipher all of that stuff and to create the new synthetic molecules that we have now that are so effective in, in many disease states. Um, but people don't understand that. They don't understand that history. They don't understand the enormous amount of money that it takes to run a discovery laboratory um, to set up a, a scientist in his own laboratory today, uh, just in equipment alone, costs in excess of $500,000. Right. And you have many of these people working, creating, you know, new molecules and testing them, et cetera. Um, it, it's, and, you know, you have, to, you have to give those people a standard of living um, that, like your background there in New York City, yeah. I mean, does it take to build something like that and right. create, you know, a, a workforce that's going to be happy doing this type of work? It's going to create cities like that. Exactly. Uh, a huge investment in industry working together that will create a better society for sure. I mean, 
look at the uh, COVID-19 drug, which of course was put on a fast track to be developed, but it changed the course of the pandemic. It did, it did. Um, that, that's a good example to look at. Um, BioNTech is a laboratory basically in Germany um, that is owned and operated by a husband and wife team. Now that's very typical. Um, um, over 80% of the uh, innovation in pharmaceuticals and even the consumption of synthetic pharmaceuticals takes place in only three areas of the world, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. And in fact, the Japanese consume twice as much per person as we do. Um, you know, so the concentration of the industry of a, a, at least the discovery part of the industry is in only a few countries, 10 at the most, whereas manufacturing could be in 50, 60, 70 countries. Um, so what happens with these laboratories like did happen with um, COVID-19 and, and BioNTech is they discover the drug. They find out that the drug works. They call Pfizer corporate and tell them Pfizer corporate has maintained a relationship with them for years, you know, funding their research, et cetera, with the, with the option to market any product and share in the profits. And that's what they did. Um, it was, it's incredible, but you have to realize that these laboratories are everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, some of these people are good. Some of them are not so good. Uh, it, but, but in any case, it takes a tremendous amount of education and specialization. And see, that, that's, that's what I perceive to be a problem. And that is that people have, it, it took place in Germany as well as Japan um, prior to the war, and it, it's taking place here now, is that people have these core competencies that are built up over many years of education and training. And when they step outside of their core competency, they, they really don't know what they're doing. Mm. Um, other people have core competencies in those areas. So that's kind of the problem that I found in my MBA classes that I was teaching. I actually was broadcasting the course into all the pharmaceutical companies, Bayer, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Shearing Plow, all of them were, get, were getting my uh, feed and had had um, employees there in front of the camera getting pursuing an, an, an M, a, uh, MBA. Um, so it was the same thing. You know, they had a core competency, although they were different. The MDs had theirs, the business students, the economists, the finance majors, et cetera. They had theirs, but they couldn't talk to each other. Yeah. Um, so I... That was one of the major reasons for me writing this book, so that people would have a very broad conceptualization of this industry worldwide, and not just what we call organic, which is a misnomer. We should call them synthetic organic molecules, um, but also I cover in the book natural products. Um, and it, most people don't realize that, for example, 50% of our steroids come from soybeans. Um, you know, Barbasco in, in um, Mexico, the Barbasco plant was the first steroid used for um, birth control pills. Uh, there are a lot of examples, of course, we know opium and we know marijuana and, and that plants can do things that are very serious. Right. Um, so I talk a bit about that because in that realm, you have large purchasers of medicinal plants. Gaia, for example, is one in, in the mountains of North Carolina, and they purchase uh, herbs from all over the world. And the people in these different areas of the world, they just go into the location where the plants are growing and they just cut them all out and haul them out. They don't replant. They don't cultivate. They don't bring the stuff back. 
slowly but surely they are destroying the th that resource right um so there's a whole new science within the pharmaceutical industry that's called economic mapping um where the, the scientists go in there and try to identify these places in the world which are ideal for certain medicinal plants um, and they are teaching the people how to cultivate, et cetera. So I do talk about that as well. But let's you talk about a lot in your book. It's a wonderful book. I think it's a book for career changers. I think it's a book for somebody thinking about getting into the pharmaceutical industry. I think it's great for people already in the pharmaceutical industry to have some perspective of the industry, the scope, the history, the economics of it all. The name of the book is The Global Pharmaceutical Industry, Economic Structure, Government Regulation, and History. It is a fantastic read. It sounds a little bit like a textbook when you it reads like a novel. It is very well written. It is a page turner. It is written by Dr. Hank Lasky, and we are delighted to have him here today as a guest on Spotlight. Hank, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, thank you very much, Logan. I, I do appreciate it very much. I hope I was able to communicate something but what you just said, I wish I had said that for people looking to make a change within the industry, people wanting to enter the industry. Again, the baby boom generation created this industry and their children may not have. They had everything life could, could, could give them in, in the American dream. Many of them did not follow their parents into the industry. So you now have grand grandchildren roaming around, you know, the Delaware River Valley, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, some in New York, some in Connecticut. Um, and I need to communicate with those people um, who do desire to enter the industry. Like you said, you said it so eloquently. And also to people who want to move up or take on greater levels of responsibility. Because let me tell you, the corporations, they need such people. They pay very well. If you can get in there and talk to them, you know, um, it's a fabulous career. Uh, it's I, We need it. Mankind. Absolutely. It's good for society. It's good for the individual. It is definitely a win-win situation. One more time, the name of the book is The Global Pharmaceutical Industry, Economic Structure, Government Regulation, and History. It's available on Amazon.com. It is a worthwhile read. We've thanked Dr. Hank Lasky for joining us here today, and I'd like to thank you at home for joining us as well. I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spotlight.